I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. God is good, and all the time, Psalm 100 verse 5, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. As long as there have been generations, whether human or divine, there has been the truth of God. And I think of that verse again, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth. Say amen for truth. Amen. His truth, it does not belong to the Seventh-day Adventist church. It is his truth. If it's biblical, it is his truth. It endureth for how long? Forever. Which means that error will one day come to an end. Amen. Along with those who persist in living their lives by error. Let me say it again. One day, false doctrines, false teachings, error will come to an end along with those who persist in living their lives by error. But we thank God for truth because without truth, there is no sanctification. What did Jesus say in his great prayer in John 17? Sanctify them through thy, thy word is truth. And sanctification is God's will for your life and mine. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 3. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. And Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Error has never sanctified anyone. It has soothed many troubled consciences. It has sanctified no one and never will. I thank God from the foundation of my soul for this honor of being with you today and for the rest of the week as God permits. It is a tremendously high honor to speak for God and this is the burden that has been placed on me and I have told God 
in so far as I am humanly possible, I will deliver, thus saith the Lord. Prophets and Kings, page 626, paragraph 1, Ella White writes, The words of the Bible and the Bible alone should be heard from the pulpit. I will restrain my opinions. I will keep them to myself, because they sanctify and save no one. But I will give you as plainly as I can, thus saith the Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. I uh, am Randy Skeet, as you heard. I am a self-supporting evangelist with an emphasis on Asia, Southeast Asia, and many countries in Africa. And that's where the Lord has taken me for the past 21 years, back and forth, back and forth. I have spent some time on a self-supporting basis with the Michigan Conference on a self-supporting basis with Lake Region Conference, briefly pastor the church for that conference. But my burden, my passion has always been evangelism going north, south, east, and west. There are some men who cannot stay one place. I happen to be one of them. And I thank God for the honor he's given me to visit every continent that's inhabited and to preach in approximately 50 countries. I hope he will add to that list. Who is with us this morning? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. May I see your hand? Ah, this is an honor. Delighted to see you. Would you kindly stand so the rest of us can see what nice-looking people look like? Please stand. Please, ladies first. What's your name? Harriet. Harriet is a good name. Harriet, thank you so much for coming. My brother, what's your name? Ben. Ben and Harriet, is there a connection between the two? Yes. What is it? Ah, she's your fiance. That's why she looks so young and happy. Well, it's nice to see the two of you. Thank you for coming. Please tell us who invited you. No one. No one. I uh, was raised as a young fellow. Mm hmm. Going to church on Saturday. Yes. Mm hmm. Yes. I didn't get what it is. Ford Church. Mm hmm. Uh, and then on Sunday I go to a Methodist. Okay. All right. Uh, I have a cousin, first cousin, who still lives at the home place here in Petersburg. Okay. Mm hmm. Uh, so I've been meeting her, her here for the last four Sundays. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, it's good to have you, Brother Ben. I would like to say one more thing. Uh, and, and, uh, not a great way. Uh, there was a Sunday Advent, Amanda's brother, Jimmy, uh, who brought me the love of Jesus Christ. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. By, by not ever saying a word. Yes. Uh, his lifestyle. Mm hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, he would go home and study his work. Well, I was about three years younger than he was, and I paid no attention to that then. But as my life went on, and I could see uh, how it ended up in shambles, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. he was my hero. He was the one I looked to and thought, you know what? I can't do this. Where is he now? He's dead. Okay. Well, thank you for following whatever inspiration he placed upon you, Brother Ben. Please keep coming. Please keep coming. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, Ben, Harriet, God bless you without ceasing, and I hope we see you from week to week. Say amen for Ben and Harriet. Is there anyone else? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. May I see your hand? Sister, please stand. What's your name? Amy. Amy? Hello, Amy. Amy, where are you from? Uh, I went to kind of back and forth and between, I went to three different high schools, Petersburg, Monaghan, and um, uh, a school in the mountains. Mm -hmm. A private school, Oakdale Academy. Who invited you today? 
Okay, all right. Ben is your father. Okay. <laughs> It's okay, my lovely sister. It's all right. So, um, you... yeah, my first day of coming was um, the, this past Saturday. Okay. So this would be my second time only coming. Well, let there be a third and a fourth and a fifth. Let the church say amen. amen. Amy, God bless you. Thank you for coming. Okay. Say amen, church. Ben, Harriet, and Amy. Is there anyone else? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. May I see your hand? If someone is hiding, please do that. <laughs> anyone else? All right. The reason why I ask, it is an honor to have guests among us. Ben, Harriet, and Amy could have chosen to be somewhere else. They chose to spend this time with us, and we honor them for coming to worship with us. And God bless you and bless you, as I said. Is there anyone with us who is not from this church? May I see your hand? You're from another church. What church are you from? The what? The West End. Where is that? Richmond. Is this Richmond? No. No, okay. All right. What is this? Petersburg. Petersburg. But God has people everywhere. All right. I saw another hand. What church are you from? Cumberland, is that a city or county? It's a, um, a county, Virginia. All right. Well, thanks for making the trip. God brought you safely. May God bless your church and your church. Anyone else? You're from a different church. Yes, sister. From where? Oh, a sister church of this. All right. God bless you. God bless you. Yes, my brother. Myrtle Beach. That's a famous name, Myrtle Beach. That's where the rich people go. Okay. Anyone? Yeah, anyone else? Anyone else? <laughs> yes, what church are you from? Shiloh. Shiloh, that's the name for Jesus. Anyone else? Yes. Hispanic Seventh Adventist Church in the West End. Any churches in the East End? No? All right. Anybody else? Yes, my brother. Mountainside in Georgia. Where in Georgia? Decatur. Decatur. Okay, okay. And that's it. Well, wherever you're from, oh, yes, my good brother. Shiloh Petersburg. So there are two Shilohs. Hmm? Just one. Oh, okay. Did I see a hand? Yes, sister. Shiloh Petersburg, just like the brother to your right. Okay. Wherever you're from, this is my father's world. Can you say amen? amen? God loves you. He really does. Don't ever doubt it. But even if you doubt it, it doesn't change his love for you. God loves you individually. I don't mean to preach several sermons, but uh, when something is pressed on my mind by the Spirit, I express it. God made Adam by himself. He did not make Adam and Eve together. He made them separately. Because God first deals with individuals. Mind, character, and personality, volume 2, page 423, paragraph 2. Ellen White writes, the gospel deals with individuals. Every human being has a soul to save or to lose. Each has an individuality separate and distinct from all others. Each must be convicted, converted himself. Each must obey for himself. No one can do this work by proxy. No one else can believe for you. And so God loves you individually. Ellen White writes in Steps to Christ, page 100, paragraph 1, the relations between God and each soul are as distinct and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth to share his watch care, not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. What is she saying? God deals with you as if no one else is alive. How many of us would love that personal attention from our spouses, our boyfriends, our bosses? We get it from God. When the shepherd lost one sheep, 
He left the 90 and 9 in the wilderness, went in search of the one. So when he found that one, it was just the one and the shepherd. How many of you love God? Can I see your hands? I love him too. Put two hands up. God has always been good to me, and as I like to say publicly, God has never done me anything wrong. All my problems in my life, and they can fill an encyclopedia, I have brought, finish my words, on myself. By acting contrary to this, every blessing in my life has come from God. And therefore, I am pleased to declare God as innocent of any wrongdoing in my life. And the moments or the occasions when I got angry with God, I was suffering from temporary insanity. <laughs> if you have gotten angry with God, tell him sorry. You know what Jesus said in John 15, 26? They hated me without a cause. No one has ever had a legitimate cause to be angry with God. But that's enough of that. Do three favors for me before I begin. Favor number one, please preserve reverence wherever you are. God is holy, whether you're in a church or on Zoom. Are you with me? The setting does not affect the holiness of God. On the backside of a mountain in the desert, he was holy. He told Moses, take your shoes off your feet. In the temple of Jerusalem, he's holy. In the tabernacle in the wilderness, he's holy. In this building, he's holy. On Zoom, he's holy. The holiness of God is not affected by surrounding circumstances. And so I call upon you as your brother, preserve reverence where you are. Two, while I'm speaking, pray for me. Simply say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. That request is based on Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9, which says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. I want God to put his words in my mouth. 2 Samuel 23, verse 2, David said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. I want God's words in my tongue. God told Moses when he sent him to Pharaoh, Exodus chapter 4 verse 12, Now therefore go, I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. That's what I want. Favor number three, think. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together. We serve a reasonable God. Satan is unreasonable. God is reasonable. God calls upon you and me, use the common sense I gave you. Much of religion is common sense, guided by the Spirit of God. Listen to God telling us to think and reason. If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, how then canst thou contend with the horses? He's calling upon us, think. You cannot keep up with a man. How do you plan to keep up with a horse? Common sense. You went to the gym to lose weight. After three months, you're 50 pounds heavier. Something is wrong. Think. I need to change what I'm doing. Are you following me? I've been seeing a man for six months, and in six months I study less, pray less, fight for my parents, don't go to church. Something is wrong. Think. Let's pray. Dear God, I am dirt. That's all I am. But you have chosen to put the treasure of truth in this dirt vessel. That the glory might be yours, dear God, because dirt cannot originate truth. I humble myself before you, Father. I deserve no blessing from you, not one, but I need all that you can give. Forgive me where I've offended you, God. Calvary exists that you might forgive. Forgive me. 
I want you to take my carnal nature by the throat and choke it into submission that only the glory of God may be revealed. God, grant your spirit of truth not only to direct my thinking and my speaking, but to enlighten those who are listening. I am so grateful, Father, for this privilege of speaking for you. Let your spirit remind me constantly as I stand in this pulpit, you are here for me, not for you. Bless every member, every family, a double blessing on the children, a triple blessing on our guests, Ben, Harriet, and Amy. Father, let this single message touch every heart, but bless not only us and me, wherever your people are worshiping you, Father, whether in a building or via the internet or Zoom. Bless them, Father. And let the presence of this church be the reason why many in this community will be ready to see you when you come. Bless the pastor. Grant him wisdom that exceeds the wisdom of Solomon, that he may guide your people aright. Watch over my family. Now, dear God, take all the glory, but give us the blessings. If anyone has contracted the coronavirus under the sound of my voice in the name of the great physician, dear God, heal that person. Not just improvement, Father. Heal the person because you love when we make big requests of you. Heal that person, God, just to be merciful because you don't like to see suffering. Here it is, humble, pray God. In Jesus' name, I offer it. Let God's people say amen and amen. Mark chapter 4, reading from verse 37, our subject, a biography of Jesus. What did I say? A biography of Jesus. Mark chapter 4, reading from verse 37. Have you found it? This is a Seventh-day Adventist church. You must find the books of the Bible quickly. We used to be called what? The people of the book. I said used to be. We ought to do everything to bring back that name. Can you say amen? What book did I say? What chapter? Reading from what verse? How many of you have the King James Version? Can I see it? That's the version I read from. I consult other versions. Please don't be feel isolated if you don't have it. But I just like to use it for memorization and for preaching in the Bible from the desk. All right, Mark 4, 37. Read with me. What does it say? And there arose a great storm of wind. And the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. This is Jesus the heat. And they awake him and said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? That's the disciples. Now listen carefully. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And, they, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Jesus seemed almost astonished. How is it that riding in a boat in my presence, ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, read it for me, what manner of man is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. Now this language is not from Revelation. It is literal. The sea and the wind obeyed it when Jesus said, peace be still. That's what he said to the sea. The Bible says he rebuked the wind, but he said something to the wind as verily as he said to the sea. The wind ceased. There was a great calm. Nature obeyed the Creator. Did not God tell Elijah in 1 Kings 17, I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. You don't have to go to this verse. 2 Chronicles 7, 13, this is God speaking. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain. How does God do that? Isaiah 5 verse 6, I will command the clouds that there rain no rain. 
God tells the cloud, do not drop rain. And there's a drought. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, God can tell the locusts, eat his crop, because he does not return a tithe and leave his alone. This is the mighty God. That's the person sleeping in that boat. I was subject a biography of Jesus. And the question they asked is our question, what manner of man is this? By the way, when you are faithful to the word of God, I mean strictly faithful, people will say, what manner of people are they? That's a weak amen, but I'll take it. <laughs> what manner of people are they? Why? Because we are living like Jesus. And if we live like Christ, what was said about Christ must be said about us. Because we will have the mind of Christ. What manner of man is this? When Christ preached, very often the people said, Never man spoke like this man. Who was he? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1, our subject, a biography of Jesus. Hebrews 1, we read from verse 8. It's one, uh, 12 o'clock on the dot. I'll release you as soon as I can. What book did I say? What chapter? Reading from what verse? 8. Let's pray again. Father, I don't want to speak long without seeking additional power. Continue to be with me, dear God. Step all over my carnal nature that I may seek only your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hebrews 1, reading from verse 8. Now, in Hebrews 1, we have an interesting uh, scenario. The Father is speaking to the Son, or of the Son, both. But unto the Son he saith, verse 8 of Hebrews 1, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Verse 9, thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now the Father continues in verse 10. Let me say it again. This is the Father speaking to his Son and of his Son. When we have controversy about the divinity, no one argues about the divinity of the Father. Even in the Adventist circles, there are arguments about the divinity of the Son. I don't know why. The Bible is so clear that he's divine, be that as it may. No one argues about the divinity of the Father. No one challenges the fact that the Father has always existed. The controversy always swirls around Jesus. Because the great controversy is a battle between Satan and Jesus. Listen now to the Father as he speaks to the Son and speaks to us. Read these words microscopically. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish. But thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as the garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Pause. Let's go back. Reread verses 10 to 12. Our subject, a biography of Jesus. Listen again to the Father. And thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth. What does the Father call the Son? Lord. But go to verse 8. What does the Father call the Son in verse 8? God. Thy throne, O God, 
This is the Father speaking, and I have to keep saying that. I am sure you've read that chapter many times, not realizing you are listening to the Father speaking of and to the Son. And God the Father, whose authority is never challenged, whose divinity is never challenged, whose eternal nature is never challenged, whose truthfulness is never challenged, he says, thy throne, O God. Now, let's be reasonable. If the Father calls Jesus God, what should I call Jesus? God. I mean, God bless Jehovah's Witnesses, but they don't see Jesus as God. They see him as a little God. But let's listen to the Father's testimony about his Son. Thy throne, O God, verse 8, is for how long? Forever and ever. It has always been there. A scepter of righteousness. What is a scepter? It is something a monarch a king or a queen holds in the hand as a visual symbol of authority and power. If you go to Africa, some African rulers, they carry sticks. One used to carry a fly swat. It's a visual symbol of power. It's a scepter. And the Father says, the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of righteousness. Then in verse 9, verse 10, he says, and thou, Lord, in the beginning. Now listen to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. If that's clear, say amen. amen. Let's say it again. Say it with me without looking. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now God the Father identifies. We know there's a we. We know that. But of the we, there was one who did the actual creating. All had a part in it. Let me explain. The Father required it done. He wanted it done. The Son did it. The Holy Ghost was involved. But the central figure is Christ, and the Father makes that clear. And so verse 10 of Hebrews 1, And thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. Now he could have said, And thou, Lord, and I hath laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the work of our hands. He does not say that. What's our subject? Come on, you're too slow. What's our subject? A biography of Jesus. He doesn't say us. He says you. Now, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 17, verse 6, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, a testimony is accepted. Are you following me? That's why against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Are you following me? All right. Let's get another witness. Let's go to John chapter 1. John 1. Let's read from verse 1 our subject, a biography of Jesus. Everything centers around and in Jesus. I mean everything. Do you have John 1? Reading from verse 1. Read it without looking. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Stop. We look at that again. How? Microscopically. It sounds like Genesis 1.1. In the beginning. John, 1 John 1, verse 1. Uh, John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and our hands have handled the word of life. So it's John, beginning, beginning, Genesis, John, John. Creation, beginning, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. Who is the word? Look at verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Bible explains itself. And so in the beginning was... Say it differently. In the beginning was Jesus. Mm -hmm. And, come on, don't look at me, look at the verse. And Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Verse 2. The same was in the beginning with God. Who is the same? Jesus. So it's repeated. 
now. Read verse 3 for me as I listen to your lovely voices. What does verse 3 say? All things were made by them. You sure you didn't see by them? All things were made by him. Keep reading. And without him was not anything made that was made. Read verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Read verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Who is this him? Jesus. What's our subject? Come on. A biography of Jesus. You need to understand that the mighty God of the Old Testament, finish my words, is Jesus who was asleep in the hinder part of that boat. Yes, it was Jesus, but say something else. Who was asleep? The mighty God. Let's go to Isaiah. No, let's go to, yes, Isaiah 40, 4 0. Let's read from verse 25, 10 after 12. When did I say I'd let you go? I never said. Okay. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 40, reading from verse 25. When you read the Bible, read it microscopically. I'm not joking. And read it as if God is speaking to you, because he is. Isaiah 12, 40. Reading from verse 25, let me pray again. God of heaven and earth, this subject is most important. Give me simple, direct, and clear language, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. To whom then will you liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Hmm. To whom can you compare me, says the Holy One? The question then becomes, who? is the Holy One who says, there is no one like me. To whom then will you liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One. Verse 26, lift up thine eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things that bringeth there out by their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one. Finish the verse. Faileth. Who created the stars? Jesus. Who made the earth? Jesus. Who is talking in that verse? Jesus. Now look at verse 25. Read it quietly, then I have a question for you. Have you read it? Read it again. Now, here's the quiz question. In your own words, what is Jesus saying? There's no one, did I hear you say that? There is no one, finish my words, like me. Thank you for that, amen. Isolated, but I love it. There is no one like me. And verse 26, lift up now thine eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things? What did God the Father say in Hebrews 1 verse 10? And that you stretch out the heavens with your hands. This is Jesus. To whom will ye liken me, says Jesus, or shall I be equal? Lift up your eyes on high. Which, let me digress briefly. This is instruction for us. When we look up, we must see evidence of God. Mm-hmm. Listen to Psalm 19.1 without going there. The heavens declare, tell me, the glory of God, God's amazing grace. Page 323, 22, paragraph 2. The glory of God is his character. 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. Image, glory, character, same thing. The heavens declare the glory of God, the characteristics of God, his love for beauty, order, can be seen by an honest examination of the heavens. Now, Isaiah chapter 6 verse 3 says, the whole earth is full of his glory. What does that tell us? Above and beneath we're surrounded by what? The glory of God, despite all the pollution on the earth. Now, the devil knows that. That's why he drives us to pollute. 
Because before there was a Bible, God's book of instruction was nature. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament sheweth his handiwork. Isaiah 6, 3, the whole earth is full of his glory. We're talking about Jesus. And the Father said in Hebrews 1.10, let's go back to Hebrews 1.10. I want to show you something else the Father is saying. You can trust the words of the Father because Deuteronomy 32 verse 4 says he's a God of truth. First John 14 verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. And First John chapter 5 verse 6, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is truth. The Father is truth. The Son is truth. The Spirit is truth. If we are God's children, we must be children of truth. Because cats gave birth to little cats, not to puppies. Are you with me? Since God created after his kind, every tree after its kind, every animal after its kind, spiritually we are created after God's kind. If he is truth, we must be truth. Hebrews 1, we read verse 10 again, we go all the way to 12. When you found it, say amen. amen. Who can recite all 66 books in order? May I see your hand? Ah, God bless you. God bless you. Come on, can I see 200 more hands? No, no. <laughs> Did I see a hand threatening to go up? No, okay, all right. Let's get to Hebrews 1 so I stop embarrassing you. Hebrews 1, let's read from verse 10. Do you have that? All right, Father in heaven, please, Lord, remember, suppress my carnal nature. Let me focus on your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And thou, read it with me, and thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. Verse 11, they shall perish, but thou remainest. Stop. No, okay, hold on, hold on. My handsome brother, hold on. <laughs> they shall perish. What does perish mean? Die. What else? Cease to exist. Come to an end. Do you understand me? They shall perish. Listen to the word of God. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. The destruction of this heaven and this earth, and then God will make a new one. And so the Bible says, they shall perish. Keep reading. But thou remainest. Ah, let's think. Something that perishes is what? Is perishable? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mortal. Temporary. Has an end. Limited. Hmm? God the Father is contrasting them with Jesus. Are you with me? Are you with me? And so he says of the heaven and the earth, they shall perish. Now let me tell you about the heaven and the earth first of all. The heavens. If you drove from the earth to the moon in a car, 60 miles per hour, without taking a break for gas, the bathroom, or snacks, It'll take you six months to reach the moon. Driving 60 miles per hour nonstop. If you drove to the sun, 60 miles per hour, no stopping for any reason, it would take you 17 years to get to the sun. Now, do you know why the universe is called space? Because most of it is empty. We see the stars at night. We think, no, no, if you travel through space, most of what you would see is vast emptiness. Now, Jesus made the universe because he is before all things. Somebody, no, some, nobody, somebody say amen. Say amen for Jesus. He is before all things. 
Now, I want to give you an idea of the vastness of the universe. In our galaxy, the Milky Way, it will take years and years and years to get to the boundary of our galaxy. There's a probe that was sent out traveling 30-something thousand miles per hour, I think. It took 30-something years to get to the edge of our galaxy. Mm -hmm. Now, God says, all of that will perish. But thou, look at the verse, remaineth. What is he saying about Jesus? He's everlasting. Give me another word. He's eternal. Give me another word. He is forever. For well, he's divine. They shall perish, but thou remainest. But the Father wants to emphasize the point. And they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same. Finish verse 12. And thy years shall not fail. You had no beginning, and you will have no end. There's only one being who can be described that way. Who is that? Tell me quickly. God. And the Father saying, my son, you are God. If Christ is not God, he cannot save you. Because the only power that can save us from Satan is the power of God. We think sin is a zit that you have on your face. So you execute it if you remember those old commercials. No. The only power, sin is such a problem that it drove God to the place where he had only one option to deal with it. One. And if that didn't work, and that option was the death of Christ. I don't care whether the sin is murder or eating a banana like Adam did, whatever fruit he consumed. The outcome was the death of the Son of God. So really, there is no such thing as a little sin. Calvary is proof. There's no such thing as a little sin. Jesus Christ must be God in order to save because no one less than God can save. They shall perish. But thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Something perfect does not have to change. The moment you change it, you're saying it wasn't perfect. Are you following me? Something perfect cannot change. That's why the law of the Lord is perfect. And since it expresses the very character of God, God is perfect and need no change. Thus, he speaks of his son. A biography of Jesus. That baby in a manger surrounded by cow dung was the mighty God. Let's go back to Isaiah 40. We pick it up from verse, well, we read 25, 26. We go to 28, 29, possibly all the way down to 31. Isaiah 40, 4 0. Isaiah is called the gospel prophet. He speaks so much about Jesus. You have Isaiah. What chapter did I say? Reading for what verse? 25. Let me pray. Dear God, continue to be with all of us through the person of your spirit and anyone else anywhere trying to preach truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To whom then will you liken me, saith the Lord? Or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? That's Jesus. Lift up thine eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things? Uh, bring it out, bringeth out the host by number. He calleth them all by names. By the way, every star has a name. And Jesus knows. Come on. All of them. Ah, uh, come on, say amen. Do you know how many stars there are in the universe? <laughs> hmm? Jesus gave a name to everyone. Because Christ is personally connected to his creation. 
are two sparrows sold for farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. Not one is forgotten before God. God is aware of every little sparrow because the creator is connected to his creation. And when one little sparrow dies, the creator feels it because originally death was not a part of his arrangement. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one falleth or faileth. They follow their courses. Verse 28. Hast thou not known? Read it with me. Hast thou not heard? That the what? The everlasting God. Keep reading. The Lord. Keep reading. The creator of the ends of the earth. Stop. Whom did God the Father say is the creator of the ends of the earth? Tell me quickly. Jesus now, keep this in mind and tell me who is being referred to in verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, who is that? The Lord, who is that? The creator, who is that? Jesus. When you talk about Jesus, you're not talking about an assistant savior. You're not talking about a ball boy on a baseball team. This is the CEO of the universe. Here's what Jesus said in his prayer to his father. Go to John 17. John 17, a beautiful chapter. Read it sometime. Go one step further and memorize the whole thing. John 17, Christ is praying to his father. And the disciples are standing there listening. Verse 9, I pray for them. John 17, verse 9, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Verse, next verse, all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Jesus says, everything the Father has, finish my words, is mine. Thank you, Lord. So that Christ cannot run out of resources to meet your needs. Uh, what's wrong with you? Come on, say amen. amen. Say it again. Amen. One more time. Amen. All that the Father hath is mine. What does the Father have? Just listen to this. For every beast of the forest is mine. And the cattle upon a thousand hills, I know all the fowls of the mountain and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Psalm 50, 10 to 12, Haggai chapter 2, verse 8, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. Now, Psalm 25, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the gold in South Africa, the diamonds in Namibia, the wood in uh, Brazil, will you name it, the copper in Zambia, mine. And I'm your savior. In my humanity, I am your brother. In my divinity, I am your God. You've got a problem? Come to me. Are you following me? All the world is mine. The universe is mine. Everything the Father has is mine. Come to me. All things the Father hath is mine. This is the God. And so he prays in John 17 verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine. Go to John 16. John 16. Read verse 15. What does that say? All things that the Father hath are mine. Go to Colossians 1, reading from verse 16. Colossians 1, verse 16, our subject, a biography of Jesus, 27 minutes after 12. Do you have Colossians 1? 
Verse 16. Read with me. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Stop. Name some invisible things. Air. Air. Have you ever seen energy? But does it work? Yes. yes. Energy is invisible. Have you ever seen electricity? Is every cell of the body surrounded by an electromagnetic field? Yes. Listen to the Bible. For by him were all things created that are in heaven. What's in heaven? Come on. Let's go to the highest heaven. Who's in heaven? The angels are in heaven. Who made them? Ah, you take so long to answer. <laughs> Who made the angels? Now, give me a specific name. Who made the angels? Jesus. Now. Jesus. Listen to Colossians 1.16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him. Finish the verse. And for him. And he is before all things. Finish 17. And by him. Do you know what that means? It is Jesus who holds the entire universe together. Go to Hebrews 1. We read from verse 1 to verse 3. Our subject, a biography of Jesus. We must leave this place with a different view of this man called Jesus, who the Father calls God. What book did I say? What chapter? One, reading from verse one. The Bible says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, read carefully now, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory, that's Jesus, is the brightness of the Father's glory, and the express image of his person, in other words, they're the same, in power, in divinity, and upholding all things, how? By the word of his power. Stop. Hmm. I don't want to go much longer, but... As the Spirit pushes me, I have to do what he says. Can you say amen? amen? Upholding all things by the word of his power. I'll ask you again. Don't wait long to answer me. Who made the earth? Jesus. Who made the heavens? Jesus. Who made the trees? Jesus. Who made angels? Jesus. Who made the beings in unfallen worlds? Who made electricity? Jesus. Who made gravity? Jesus. Who made the trees? Jesus. The air? Jesus. Jesus. Everything, Jesus. And Jesus places all of that at the disposal of the church as the church has need. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Ephesians 1, the last two verses of that chapter. Everything under the control of Christ is at the disposal of the church, as the church has need. Jesus Christ who sat on that well in John chapter 4 and said to the Samaritan woman, give me to drink, because he was genuinely thirsty. That was the one who made water. Jesus Christ, in verse 31 of John chapter 4, to whom the disciples say, Master, eat, they brought food from the village. He was the one who created food. Jesus took your condition. Are you with me? 
that through him we may be lifted to a position exceeded only by God. Ah, you didn't hear what I said. You didn't hear what I said. Let me say it again. Jesus took our condition that we through him might be elevated to opposition, exceeded only by God. Because we will take Lucifer's place. And no one was higher than Lucifer. Hmm. Let me ask you this. If Christ, now let me tell you one thing, then I'll come to the other. You said Christ made the trees, the heavens, the earth, the water, electromagnetic force. You know how he did it? You know how he did it? By his word. Mm -hmm. By his word. I think some members from, as somebody said he's from Georgia, I think, Decatur, Georgia. Isn't Lookout Mountain in Georgia? You go to Lookout Mountain, God made it somehow. He formed the mountains, I, uh, Psalm 90, verse 2. Jesus, by his word. The angel Gabriel, by his word. Are you looking at me or through me? Do you understand what I'm saying? The mightiest being in heaven now, less than God, is Gabriel. He was made just by God saying, come. No dirt was used. Are you with me? Listen to Petras and Prophets, page 38, paragraph 3. What book did I say? Page 38, paragraph 3. Christ was the Son of God. He had been one with him before the angels were called into existence. They were just called out of nothing. But let the Bible strengthen that point. Psalm 148, verses 1, 2, and 5. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Verse 5. Praise, verse 2. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Verse 5. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. Commanded, this is it. Let me stress the word of God now. Because Jesus says, I am the word. When the word is stressed, Jesus is stressed. When Christ comes a second time, his name shall be the word of God. Revelation 19, verse 13. He commanded, and they were created. Christ did everything by the word. There's something else he does by the word. He sustains creation by the word. When God said, let there be light, that was Jesus speaking, and there was light. You know what the Bible says about that statement? Four words, let there be light. The Bible calls those four words a command. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, let's read verse 6. Our subject, a biography of Jesus, 25 minutes to 1. Do you have 2 Corinthians? What chapter did I say? What verse? Six. When you found it, say amen. amen. If you're still looking, say amen. amen. <laughs> okay. Hurry up, hurry up. Do you have it now? Yes. Read it with me and read microscopically. Are you ready? Let's read. Let's pray first. Father, I'm coming to the downslope of this message, but Father, don't decrease your power. Continue to use me, Father, please. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, the Bible says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Now, let's identify the darkness. Go back to Genesis 1. Let's read from 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now read verse 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So when Paul says, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, he's right. And so when God said, let there be light, that was a command. If that's clear, say amen. amen. Let there be light was a command. Now think with me. Take a deep breath, think. Listen to verse 6. 
And God said, let there be a firmament. Hmm? What was that? A command. <laughs> if let there be light was a command, let there be a firmament, come on, was a command. Look at verse 11. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass. What was that? Come on, quickly. A command. Then, this one is tough, but you'll get it right. All of creation was made by what? Command. If that's the case, and I live in a world made by command, what kind of life should I live to fit in? An obedient life. Obedient to what? God's commands. But what does the devil get preachers to say? God's law has been? You can live in a world created by command disobediently. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. You're on the way out if you do that. And it won't be easy or pleasant or swift or sweet. A world made by command. A world sustained by command. Why do I say that? Go to 2 Peter chapter 3 quickly. I'm closing off a biography of Jesus. 2 Peter chapter 3, we'll read verses 5 and 7. We have established biblically the world, the universe was made by command. Now we're about to establish it is sustained by command. But what command? You'll be pleasantly surprised. Do you have 2 Peter chapter 3? Reading verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. By the word of God, which is the command. Look at verse 7. But the heavens and the earth which are now, keep reading, by that same word are kept in store. Stop. I'll make a statement and I'll leave a blank. You, f you fill in the blanks. The word that creates is? Ah, uh, God bless you and keep you handsome all the days of your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The word that creates, finish it for me on this side, is the word that sustains. Not a different word. Now, when God created... Verse 30, 20, the 31 of Genesis 1, he said, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was? How was it done? Come on, come on, be fast. By command, the word. Now, creation was very good by the word. Now, if the same word sustains, at what level should it be sustained? Very good. Mm -hmm. There is no lowering of quality in sustaining the quality of work at creation is the quality of work at sustaining. Amen. Now, what did Jesus say? Man shall not live by bread alone, come on, but by every word. Creation was by the word, and we are to live by the word. At the high level of excellence. Because the same word that created and led God to say very good, this word must produce in us a life that leads God to say very good. As he said of Abel, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. God himself said, this is a righteous life. Because any life lived according to the creative word will produce the same effect as was produced at creation when God said, very good. Now, but this word is the very life of Christ. Amen. I'm not saying Christ lives in the pages. It's not the page made from a tree or the ink. No. It's what the word says. Amen. Ellen White writes, the creative power that call the worlds into existence is in the word of God. This word imparts power. 
it begets life. Every command is a promise. Accepted by the will, received into the soul, it brings with it the life of the infinite one. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God, this word. Because at his highest, the word is Jesus. That's why he's the Alpha, come on, and the Omega. A biography of Jesus. Jesus is the mighty God. Listen to Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us... A child is born. Come on. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Come on. Counselor. Come on. The Mighty God. The Everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. He will be called the Mighty God. And when you read Everlasting Father, it simply means the Father of Eternity. Eternity flows from Jesus. This is the one in whose name you are to pray. Because without Christ, the Father can do nothing for you. Not that he doesn't want to, he cannot. Because of sin, any blessing the Father has for you must go through, finish my words, Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's why you pray in the name of Jesus. Because he's God, perfect. He is human, perfect. It was he who said, it is finished. It was he who said, let there be light. It was he who said, I am the resurrection and the life. It is he who said, Lazarus, come on, come forth. How did he raise Lazarus? A biography of Jesus. And God the Father himself said, Thy throne, O God. He called Jesus God. In verse 10, And thou, Lord, in the beginning. He's God and Lord. As God, he's Savior. As Lord, he's ruler. A lot of us want Christ to be Savior, but not ruler. Save me and let me do what I want. It doesn't work. He must be God and Lord. Come on, say amen. He must be both. How many of you will say, Father, having heard your word, I recommit my life to Jesus. Can I see your hand? I recommit my life to Jesus. Stand up with me. I love Jesus. He's a nice person. He forgives. He forgets. I will forgive all the iniquity. I'll forget the trial. How does God forget? You know, we forget favors people do to us. We remember all the insults. We have an encyclopedic memory for insults. God doesn't remember them. You know, Ellen White writes in Steps to Christ, page 62, paragraph 2, if you give yourself to him and accept him as your savior, then, sinful as though your life may have been, for his sake, you are counted righteous. Christ's character stands in place of your character, and you are accepted before God just as if you had never sinned. It is as if you sit in a class, and Jesus sits in a class, and your grades are C, D, E, F, G, H, I, all the way down to Z. And the grades, the grades of Jesus are A+, plus, A+, plus, A+, plus, A+, plus, A+. Plus. And then Jesus takes that transcript and puts it on your name. Heads bowed, eyes closed. God the Father. If I said anything I should not have said, forgive me, dear God, in my enthusiasm, I may have misspoken. If I did that, I'm sorry. I'll try to do better next time. But I hope I said something, dear God, to defend the divinity of Jesus. I hope I said something based on your word that opened the eyes of your people to understand who their Savior is. That that baby in the manger, that man asleep on the boat, that man on the cross was the mighty God and is still the mighty God. 
Ah, God, let that increase our faith and give us courage to face the day-to-day -day trials. It was that mighty God who said, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I, the mighty God, have overcome the world, and my victory is yours through faith in me. Father, forgive us for our lack of faith in Jesus. Forgive us for doubting your word. Forgive us for viewing the enemy as more powerful than you by surrendering to him all the time. Let us now recommit our lives to you, God, and to resolve to attach ourselves to your power by attaching ourselves to your word. Bless every man, every woman, dear God. A double blessing on the children and our guests. May we leave this place resolved in our hearts like Daniel purposed in his heart. Let us purpose to put our hands in the hand of the mighty God who is also our brother in human flesh. Thank you for truth that sanctifies. As we eat, let us remember our food came from you and not the supermarket. Please, God, bring us back this afternoon, bring us back this afternoon or whenever the next service is. May we walk with a pep in our step as we leave this church. We pray in Jesus' name. Let God's people say amen, amen and amen. Remain standing, please, as we uh, go to our closing hymn this morning. Did everybody learn a little bit about Jesus this morning? Yeah. And so we're going to continue to do that for uh, several days now. So let's go to our theme song, number 213 in our hymnals, Jesus is Coming Again. What will you take from the message? Raise your hand and tell us. Yes, sister. Jesus is everything. Jesus is everything. Somebody else, raise a hand. Yes. Jesus is, God, just as much as the Jesus is as much God as the Father is God. Thank you, my young brother. Somebody, just raise. Yes, sister. Ah, uh, we can all say amen. Without Jesus, you think you came here because you could drive? 
The Bible says, in him we live. Come on, and move. Come on, and have our... You cannot do this without Jesus. Ah, you didn't hear what I said. You cannot do this without Jesus. For to do this, muscles have to work. Electrical signals have to be generated. Some, some, some filaments have to pull against each other. You cannot do this without Jesus. Why? He upholds all things. Yes, sister. It's all right. Mm-hmm. You can't move a finger without Jesus. We can't think a thought. You cannot without Jesus. Because to describe your thought, you have to speak. And to speak, you need muscles moving. You cannot express your mind without Jesus. Somebody, thank you, somebody, yes. He is the, God has nothing to say to you outside of Jesus. He is the Alpha and the Omega. You know what Ellen White writes about Jesus in the Tsar of Ages, page 19, paragraph 2. By coming to dwell with us, Christ was to reveal God both to men and to angels. He was the Word of God, God's thought made audible. Isn't that powerful? When you listen to the words of Jesus, you're listening to the mind of God, God's thought, the Alpha and the Omega. Yes, my little sister. Jesus? Oh, yes. And Jesus was your age. How old are you? Ten? Seven. Jesus was seven. He was a good boy. Are you a good girl? Say yes. Okay, all right, okay, okay, all right, okay. Who else? What will you take? Yes, my brother. Jesus, my forever friend, is the one who has all power. A forever friend. We leave him. He doesn't leave us. He has all, let me tell you something, thinking of what my brother said. If Jesus has all power, it's a dangerous thing to mess with a child of God. Are you following me? If someone's harassing you, take it easy. Jesus will, you cannot deal with your enemy the way Jesus can. God told the Israelites, leave Egypt. And he opened the way, they crossed. The Egyptians made the mistake of crossing. God destroyed every single soldier. Because if God doesn't tell you cross, don't come. That's presumption. The Israelites crossed by faith. The Egyptians came by presumption and paid the price. What will you take from the message? And let me close and send you home. Yes. The Father and Jesus are co-equal. Mm-hmm. That's why they sit. The, father, the son sits right next to the father. Yes. No. God, God, Christ was begotten by the Father. Then that Christ couldn't be God. Christ was never begotten. He has been there. Listen to what the Bible says. Listen, I'm glad you raised that. Listen to the Bible. Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Listen carefully. Before the mountains are brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. And who is that? Jesus Christ. Anything that has a beginning cannot be God because the Bible says he is before all things. It's a teaching in the Adventist, not a teaching. It's common in the church. It is not biblical. And Ellen White makes it very clear that Jesus Christ had no beginning. But without Ellen White, the Bible is quite clear on that point. No beginning. Uh, God cannot be begotten. Only created beings can be created. To be God, you must have been there forever. Our minds are too limited to grasp it, but the Bible gives us sufficient evidence. All right, let me pray and close. Father, thank you for your people who love you. Thank you for the word that stimulates the mind and actually regenerates the mind. Dear God, as we leave let us leave determined to walk in your word. As you tell us in Psalm 119, verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Let us walk in thy, this light, I pray. One more time, bless everyone who heard this message, I pray. Take all the glory to God. Give us the blessings we need. In the sweet name of Jesus, let God's people say, 
Amen and amen. I'll see you this afternoon, Pastor. What time? Four o'clock. Four o'clock.